Hello, it's Jane Simonson here. I'm the Chief Executive of the International Development Alliance. And welcome to this webinar. It's great that you could join us. Uh, the Alliance, for those who don't know us very well, is a network of about 157 organizations who are either based in or represented in Scotland, varying between some very large organizations who are household names to some very small organizations with no office, no staff, purely a volunteer run, trustee run organization. Uh, we also have a new uh, category of members which is growing for private individuals, people who want to join our alliance who aren't affiliated to any organization, but who would like to use us and their contacts with us and our members as a means of supporting the objectives which we all have together uh, uh, to promote and encourage effective international relief and development in Scotland. The Scottish Government's Small Grant Scheme was launched in 2013. So we're now on uh, 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 about the sixth iteration of the Small Grants Fund. It's been opening once a year, every year, and has been worth in total about four. £500,000. This year, because there is a review on, it's a bit different. The total size of the fund is less. It's only 300000 in total. And this year, uh, the Scottish Government is not inviting three-year project applications as it often does. That's the bad news bit. The good news is that they have raised the cap on the one-year one-off uh, feasibility grants and capacity building grants uh, it has been a limit of 10,000 to spend in one year, and it's gone up to 15,000 to spend in one year. Uh, I have the privilege of being able to see the Scottish Government's small grants program in the context of uh, other wider funding opportunities, not only here in Scotland, but across the UK. And I have to say, I'm a very big fan of this program. I think it's a uniquely valuable asset in Scotland. So I'm so pleased that you're interested in applying. Uh, to be able to get the fund to continue, we need to be able to put in really good quality applications and prove to our friends at the Scottish Government that this is uh, a necessary, vital, useful contribution, not only to our efforts together to meet the Sustainable Development Goals, but furthermore to build the capacity of small Scottish uh, organizations in the international development sector. So I hope you will enjoy this session. Uh, do please uh, uh, make sure you can help us to help you. We want you to feel more equipped and more confident applying to the Scottish Government Small Grants Programme as a result of having taken part today. Uh, we're going to hook you up with uh, uh, the CORA Foundation as represented by the International Programs Manager, Chrissy Hurst. So she will be presenting to you shortly and then taking your questions. Uh, and we particularly want to uh, see what we can do to hear from you about the grant application process, what you find uh, difficult and how we can help. Uh, we can provide you with some additional support, and I'll come back to them again later, but it will be to do with the process of developing an application uh, rather than uh, getting too close to undertaking to do it for you, uh, which in a way would be a thoroughly false and hopeless offer because you know your own work and how you can portray your own work far better than anybody else ever can. So with that, I am going to hand over to Chrissy and uh, she will be presenting to you and then at the end of her presentation we will be taking some questions thank you so much jane and uh, and a big thank you to the alliance as we start it's really nice to have another opportunity to talk about the small grants program because it's one of the most important things that we do as in cora foundation for the scottish government as part of their international development programs there's always a lot of interest and it's always exciting to see the proposals that come in each year 
So as Jane was saying, this year is a little bit different and I will get onto that uh, in just a minute. But to start with, I'd like to, to just uh, recap on who can apply because that's often the sort of, it, it's a very helpful starting point and it's, it's, it's a really important area to double check because the last thing we want is for organizations to be going a, a, a long way down that sort of challenging road of preparing a proposal and then realizing only later on that in fact they're not eligible. So as Jane was saying, this is a program that the Scottish Government runs uh, and part of the aims for that program are to help build the capacity of the international development sector in Scotland and to support smaller organisations. So smaller for this grants program means organizations which have a turnover of less than 250,000 for the last two years. Um, there also applicants need to be legal persons, um, which means they need to have been registered for at least 12 months. We are able to look at that if it's very close um, and you haven't actually been registered for the full 12 months at the, at the point of application, which is the 8th of November, uh, a date I shall come back to a couple of times through this, through this uh, presentation, then we will accept applications for organizations which will have been registered for 12 months uh, on the 31st of December this year. Uh, there is also the criteria of being Scottish uh, and this while organizations that are registered in England and Wales can apply um, because this is a grant program which is funded from by the Scottish Government which means by from Scottish taxpayers money um, there is a need that there is a substantive link with Scotland and essentially what this means in practice is that there are premises in Scotland uh, from where the grant would be managed by a, a designated project manager in Scotland. Uh, so if you have any questions about the, specific, the specificities of that, we're really happy to discuss, but it is an important point. Um, organizations also need to be working internationally in a substantive way and adding value. Um, and by this, uh, what we are looking for are applications from organizations that are have a, a, a really solid amount of their work as international or see that as an area to develop and that they add value because there are some situations where we've had applications in the past where organizations have very strong links with a partner organization abroad but essentially they are acting as a conduit for funds uh, and and that is the limit of the role of the Scottish organization so the kind of partnerships which the Scottish government is hoping to support through this grant program sees a more substantive kind of relationship and that there is real sort of meaningful input from both the partner organization in the target country and also from the the lead applicant based in Scotland. The work can be in any country which is classed as low to medium on the UN Human Development Index. And normally with this grant program, as Jane was mentioning, there are project grants and for those larger grants, there has been traditionally a limit to the three priority countries of, for the Scottish Government for their international development work of Malawi, Rwanda and Zambia. But because this round there are no project grants, for all of the grants concerned, it's an open playing field. So any country ranked as low to medium uh, on the latest uh, indexing by the UN Human Development Team. Um, what applicants also need to do is ensure that they are currently working in line um, with various aspects of the due diligence checks that we will do on all applicants. So this concerns having solid governance and having equality and diversity and safeguarding policies. These are essential documents which are, you're required to submit as a lead applicant. And for those who are following my presentation closely, you will see there is a little asterisk next to the safeguarding policies. And that is because there is no need to submit a safeguarding policy if you are applying for a capacity building grant, the focus of which will be to develop a safeguarding policy uh, or to develop further 
uh, uh, an existing safeguarding policy. So, and, and this is, I think, one of the really useful opportunities that you have with this particular program in that there is, uh, it is a chance to apply for a grant to strengthen your, your organization in and of itself. So what's different about 2020? As Jane was mentioning, there is a review that's going on of the Small Grants Programme, um, which is actually, I think, very timely because it's a very popular programme and it's six years on and it's a good, a good point to, to stop and check whether it's achieving everything that it was originally intended to achieve. And because of that, so that the, the conclusions from the review will be able to feed more directly uh, the future iterations of the programme and Scottish Government policy going forward, this year will only offer grants for a maximum of 12 months. So previously there had been a chance to apply for project grants of up to 60,000 and up to three years. So this is not on the table this year. The grants that are on offer are only for feasibility studies or capacity building grants. But, as Jane highlighted, now the budget limit for these has gone up. And so the limit is £15,000 per grant. So a 12-year limit on your time period to implement the work, but a budget limit of £15,000 per grant. The other thing um, that will be different about 2020 is that it will require online applications. Um, so that will be easier for some people and, and potentially for others will require a bit more preparation, but is something which is different about this year. And so if, it, if it's something that you feel would be important to check in advance, then, then please do. We have uh, a, a kind of list of online hints and tips specifically for the online applications uh, on the CORA website. And I should also highlight that in 2020, you will not be able to apply for a feasibility study and a capacity building grant, or for two of each. It is one application per organization. So moving on to partner criteria. As I was saying earlier, the Scottish organization is required to be the lead applicant. And that is the organization which should apply to CORA Foundation for the grant. Local partners, are required, and when we say local partners, we mean organizations that are based in the target country overseas. So if you were doing work in Rwanda, for example, your local partner cannot be based in Malawi. So they need to be in the country where the work will happen. But there's nothing to say that if you have uh, work happening in Rwanda and you have a local partner in Rwanda, that also including another partner in Malawi who might have expertise um, and, and sort of uh, experience to share with others on the project, that that would not be possible to have as an additional partner. So partners are required for feasibility study grants. There must be a local partner in the target country. For capacity building grants, a local partner is optional in the sense that with the capacity building grants, all of the capacity building can be focused on the Scottish organization and take place in the UK. However, if the capacity building grant involves work with organizations and communities overseas, as well as work in Scotland or instead of work in Scotland, then there must be a local partner. So here it's, it's a sort of a, a common sense approach. If your capacity building will involve people overseas, there must be an overseas partner to help facilitate that. But with the capacity building grant, you have a lot of flexibility. It can be just for your organization in Scotland. It can be just for your partner overseas, or it can be a mix. We have a lot of successful projects which have a sort of mirrored processes, whether that's on safeguarding or monitoring, evaluation and learning, where the Scottish organization strengthens their processes, the partner overseas strengthens their processes, and there is a really nice opportunity for exchange and discussion through that sort of concurrent process. Preferences. So having done criteria, moving on to preferences, the preferred and welcomed aspects of applications. So despite the fact that with feasibility studies and capacity building grants, the world's ranked low and medium 
on the UN Human Development Index is your oyster. However, there is still a preference for activities which will happen in the Scottish Government partner countries of Malawi, Rwanda and Zambia. It is also, uh, there is also a preference from Scottish Government that the projects proposed are able to strengthen organisations' governance and safeguarding policies and procedures. And this is very much in line with the strong policy signals and directions which Scottish Government has been giving all of us in the sector recently. Uh, and there are so many opportunities to, to really sort of seize that, um, particularly with the level of support which the Alliance is offering, among others. Um, there is a preference for applications from diaspora-led organizations. These are particularly welcomed. Um, as are applications which deal with the thematic area of civic governance which tends to be a generally less a thematic area that we see applications responding to uh, and applications which support innovation. Also, another aspect which is welcomed and is something that the Scottish Government is really keen to see is dovetailing or collaboration across the sector. And by dovetailing, what we mean is there is a, another project or an existing grant, and then a subsequent project kind of adds on something which is not essential to that other that first project to succeed, but which is a really nice complementary activity that sort of augments or sort of adds value in a significant way to that, to that original project. Essentially, having a sum of the parts which is greater um, than the, the, the standalone grants and, and inevitably um, this is something that Scottish Government is keen to encourage across its, its grant making. So moving on to the application. Um, the first steps you will see, and here I would highlight that on the CORA website, while the applications will be online, um, we have Word documents, or rather PDFs, which present the application form clearly, and uh, you have little instructions in red font to show you the kind of content that we expect in each of the boxes. So these are available on the CORA website and I would really, really encourage them as a kind of, maybe almost, maybe if you, if you look at the criteria document first, but then the application form guidance notes for capacity building and feasibility study, these would probably be the second document that it would, I would encourage you to look at. So the first steps, a grant title, and here I would plead to please keep it short and to have a grant title which actually says something about your project, because you have to imagine the assessment that will follow, the grant making that will follow, the contracts that will follow. Your grant title will be used in so many places, and if it goes on for three full lines, <laughs> or if it's very hard to figure out what the project is actually about, um, then that will be a, a, a sort of a communication issue for you for the life of this funded project. And then a grant aim or a statement. And with this, what we're really looking for is a one sentence snapshot. And again, this is one to really think about when you draft, because if your project is successful, this will be the sentence that we would aim to use in promotional material uh, about the project. So there are examples in the guidance notes to, to sort of give you a bit of a template, which may be helpful for you to follow. Um, Moving on then with the application, the next section really is looking uh, for you to tell us about who is applying. So background on your organization uh, and your partner organization, if it's a feasibility study or if you have a, a capacity building partner, history of your work, the skills that you will bring to the project, your knowledge of the subject. You might bring lots of management skills, but if it's in a technical area where your organizations and your colleagues have not worked before, then that is also something that we would pick up. So we want to know what is that experience that you have in your teams that is relevant to the proposal and that might be within your board even if it's not within the specific staff or volunteers that will be working uh, on the project so do tell us about that we also want to hear about organizational strength because that's very important into in in judging how well the project will go if it's funded and what the risks are for scottish government as a funder so we want to hear about your internal governance we will check your oscar returns and we will review the accounts that you send in 
We'll look at things like reserves and stability and the strength of your systems. And this goes back again to that need to have equality and diversity and safeguarding policies. And also what oversight systems there are in place. So for very small organizations, it may be a situation where board members are themselves managing the project uh, or doing most of the work. And so here we would be looking to see evidence that the organization has actually thought about the potential conflicts of interest there uh, and what are those checks and balances and oversight mechanisms that, that can be brought to the management of the project. We'd also want to see in these sections background on people and relationships. So the experience of the specific proposed project manager in a CV, uh, as well as the CV for the proposed project manager in country, and any experience of past joint work as individuals or as organizations, uh, and what essentially, what are the things that these people will, will bring to the project during its lifespan that will really show us that there is a solid chance this project will be a stonking success, um, rather than something which is perhaps a little bit, a little bit risky or something where we would need to, to ask more questions about whether the organizations are as prepared as perhaps they need to be. And here I would underline that uh, in this, this, these sections where we ask, we want to know about who's applying, attachments are crucial. Um, and with every round, there is a list of essential documents which we require, uh, including CVs, including evidence uh, of accounts and this kind of thing. Uh, and sadly, every round, there are organizations that fail to upload those uh, and send them in with their final app. So I would really encourage people to double check on all of that. The next bit of the application looks at what is the need. And here we want you to tell us what is the problem. Give us sufficient background so that we understand what it is you are trying to tackle. This is where if there is a formal needs assessment or an informal needs assessment, we'd ask you to present it. We also, it's really important here that you tell us about what stakeholder consultation you've done. Um, we want to hear from the community. We want to hear from local and national authorities, other actors and implementers to check that even if there is an established need, there's a, a clear problem, a clear need established. It's obvious what needs to happen. But if you haven't checked with the other implementers around, then maybe another international NGO or another local NGO is already tackling it. These are the things that we want to hear about. We also want to hear about how what you're proposing fits with the policies and strategies that are relevant. So the global goals, Scottish international development priorities, the national level priorities and strategies of the target country and the local level. So there may well be regional or district action plans or strategies on particular topics. And we want to see that you've consulted those to make sure that what you're doing is really supporting um, coherent, cohesive uh, development efforts. And in all of these points where you are explaining needs and, uh, and consultations, we really want to hear about gender and diversity. So who have you consulted? Which groups? Have you consulted all groups? Have you taken into consideration specific needs when you have done your assessments um, and, uh, and consulted people and looked at perhaps you are working on girls' education? So have you looked at not only national strategies for education, but also for women's empowerment, because they might be uh, both relevant. They are very likely to both be relevant. Then moving on into what you will do. Um, here, again, uh, not to forget gender and diversity, because we do expect that. So we, we expect to see that popping up in pretty much every box. Um, so here we expect you to explain your proposed intervention. So what we would usually call a project, although this is not a project grant because these applications are just for capacity building and feasibility study grants. So for capacity building, this would be telling us about what are the key areas that you're going to look at and what are the changes or improvement which you want to see for your organization as a result of these capacity building activities. And for feasibility studies, to be really clear on 
what is the question which you're going to answer or what is the thing that maybe it's a methodology or approach that you're testing but be very very clear about it um, clearly frame the results which you want to achieve so if it's capacity building what will it mean for your organization will it be a new fundraising strategy that will double your income in the next three years if it's a feasibility study on a new methodology um, will the results mean that you will be able to do XYZ new things in, in new places then we want you to be very clear when you tell us what activities will be undertaken by who where and when so essentially the steps that you will undertake uh, and uh, a work plan uh, more or less we don't ask for a Gantt chart or anything with small grants but we do we do have sections in the application form where we need you to present us um, what steps will be undertaken when the application also asks once you've told us what you will do more about how you will do it so for feasibility studies, what will be your methodology and how will you disseminate the learning? Both really key points, <laughs> um, particularly as there is the expectation that if there is learning, it's shared widely so that uh, a large number of people can benefit. We want to hear whether you have really considered all the risks we want to hear about the steps that you'll take uh, to monitor, evaluate and learn from the grant. We want to hear about sustainability and here we really want to hear about your exit strategy. So perhaps if it is a one-off feasibility study, this will be sort of, it might seem obvious, um, but it, it's not obvious always. And so we want to hear from you what will be the things that will be left behind from your study and what will your intervention or your assessment going in and out, what will that mean for the communities and the partners that are involved? What happens next? And all these factors are really key um, in considering the potential for unintended negative outcomes. Um, so you may not, uh, of course, anticipate that some things will be left worse off as a result of your project, but it's really important that you've thought around that and, uh, and really looked at the risks that perhaps by going in and doing an assessment of whether a community needs, I don't know, for example, a renewable energy source, and your consultation concludes yes they need a renewable energy source and everybody's expectations have been raised and small businesses make you know plans anticipating that the village will suddenly have a renewable energy source um, and so when that renewable energy, energy source doesn't appear because you can't deliver it um, that people are left worse off so this is a kind of a, a rather extreme hypothetical, um, but it's the kind of thing that we would really expect you to think around when you're telling us about sustainability and exit strategy and risks. The next bit of the application is really the budget, the money stuff. Um, all those stuff are also really important and of course are, are things that are reflected in the budget as well as in other places in the application. So with the budget, the things that really make us happy when we look at a budget are clear presentation within the categories that are laid out. We like to see a budget which is within the limits which are published as part of the guidance. So capital costs should not be over 20% unless they are relate to renewable energy when it can go up to 50%. And important to highlight here uh, that capital costs also depending on the situation um, we would not be if there are high transport and installation costs that we would also be looking at those so if you scrape under 50 percent for your renewable energy capital costs but then you have another 20 percent of your budget which involves transportation and installation that we would be asking a lot of questions about that match funding is a possibility for these grants but only up to 50 percent so another you can have your own money or funds from another donor for 50% of the grant but not more than and for feasibility studies there is a limit of 8% on costs out with the country of implementation and for most uh, applications that means there is a limit on 8% of costs which are in a way home Scottish costs uh, and so that needs to include staff but can but does exclude expertise if it is specifically related to the implementation of the feasibility study 
Budget notes are listed as something which is required um, and I would really encourage you to make sure that you do provide these because um, it's again something that we see in a lot of applications. It's noted as essential but then often people uh, just don't we have we have training listed as five thousand pounds and then no explanation or breakdown of that so we do expect budget notes we also like to see budgets which match the activities outlined in the proposal so uh, it might seem very obvious but often there will be budgets that we receive where it's not exactly clear the costing for a certain activity so please just try and if you've numbered your activities make sure that they are numbered or, or named clearly in the budget and then highlight key and kind contributions such as staff time or use of an office or a vehicle for example So with that as the, the final sort of chunk of the application being the budget, moving on, I would just really like to highlight the support that uh, is available when you're applying. So I had mentioned already the CORA website. We have a whole host of documents there. And you're also very, very welcome to contact myself and Lillian at the international email address. And our, our details are also at the end. And then I know that uh, the Alliance and Scotland Malawi Partnership um, are also available to give different kinds of support and ideas and suggestions and much more of a kind of um, feedback on the quality of drafts. So with this, it's, it's a great sort of separation of roles because while as the CORA Foundation, we can say this is acceptable or that is not acceptable in terms of the application form and the criteria, what we can't do is look at a proposal and say, hmm, had you thought about this or maybe you should strengthen that um, because that then compromises our ability to and our impartiality for assessing that application later on. However, the Alliance and SMP can do that. So this is something that I would really encourage people to take advantage of. And then a final couple of slides uh, looking at uh, just a list, maybe, I hope it's useful, um, of classic mistakes um, to avoid, which are leaving it too late, um, skipping some of the requirements for formal documents, which I mentioned earlier, letters of support, CVs, they are important. Um, please, don't, uh, please don't go over the word limits and don't attach additional documents with sort of additional pages of needs assessment or, 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 uh, or, or other information. Uh, and please respect the budget limits. Um, the classic wins, the things which we love to see and which we um, are fairly confident are generally associated with successful applications, are to start early, call us early if you're not sure about anything, gather all your documents early, um, respect the deadline because I'm afraid it is a guillotine deadline and so if your application is 10 minutes late we will not be able to accept it. I, I really would underline that. And, the deadline is noon on the 8th of November 2019, so we need all of the applications sent in by then. Uh, and essentially, clearly present a clear plan. <laughs> this is one of the biggest pieces, the biggest and most basic pieces of advice I would have. And then to finish up, just to, uh, just to share that myself and Lillian are at the end of the phone, at the end of the email, if you have any questions. And we will be so much happier to hear from people and answer your questions early on, rather than have uh, often volunteers put in hours of time and then realize only too late that uh, a certain application won't fly because it doesn't meet some of our rules. So thank you so much for the chance to talk about this program. Uh, and I look forward to talking more about it. Thank you, Chrissy. I found that really, really helpful. And that's after having read the website, everything that you have available already on the CORA website. Uh, so you supplemented that beautifully with some uh, uh, vivid real life examples of uh, what can work really well and what the obvious gaps are and why people sometimes fail. So Chrissy, thank you. We've got some questions. So uh, uh, we'll start with the questions that we have, but please keep thinking of them. For those who haven't put a question forward, we will have about 10, 15 minutes for this. So keep the questions coming if you haven't put them forward yet. I would ask you to keep them 
uh, general if you can rather than too specific to your own application just simply because this is an event this webinar where we're all sharing so therefore for the sake of the other participants in the webinar don't dive too deep into the detail of your own uh, proposed application so uh, Chrissy in the hope that you can see the questions on your screen I'm not going to introduce you to your questioners one by one I'm simply going to hand over to you Thank you, Jane. So uh, we have two questions. Um, the first is, if you have a presence in Scotland, but also a satellite office in Malawi, can the same organization be the local lead? Uh, uh, and then the, the, the sort of sub point that if they are also working with other organizations locally too. So here, Scottish government requires a partnership. So if if you have if it is essentially the same organization the same legal entity which just happens to have registered addresses in scotland and malawi then this wouldn't work and what i would encourage you to do is to identify from these other local organizations that you envisage collaboration with to identify a, a lead local partner um, because because we uh, we need to see i mean essentially it's it's a very sort of uh, a very intelligent criteria that Scottish Government has. They want to promote partnership um, of Scot with Scotland and, and with other countries uh, internationally. And a really sort of sensible way to do that and to make sure that there are local perspectives included in project design, that there is a, a channel for learning both of the Scottish organization and of the organization in the target country is to require a partnership. And so that is one of the, the sort of fundamental aspects of, of most of the Scottish Government grants is that they require an organization based in Scotland to be partnering with an organization overseas. So if it is technically the same organization, um, the same legal entity, just with different registered addresses, then I'm afraid it wouldn't work. Um, but I, if, if, there is, if there is more nuance to that, then I would just encourage you to, to email or to call myself or Lillian and then we can go through the, the specifics because I realize that, you know, there is, there is a gray area where you have sister organizations that have separate registered entities but are kind of linked in some sort of organizational family sense. Then it becomes, it's, it's better to talk about it on a case by case basis. But essentially, if it's the same legal entity, then I'm afraid that wouldn't mean the criteria to have a partnership. Obviously, however, for capacity building grants, that wouldn't be an issue. So if it's a capacity building grant that includes work uh, just in Scotland, then that would be fine. If it's a feasibility study, however, that would require uh, a, a, a partnership in, in, a, in a sort of more substantive sense between two organizations that are separately registered. Uh, and then the second question um, was, can we apply for a grant that includes more than one country, e.g. Malawi and Zambia, or does ScotGov prefer one country? So here, I think that there is perhaps, um, uh, there is maybe an assumption that there is usually one focus country, but it is not a requirement. So if you have a proposed feasibility study that is looking at um, assessing sort of a new methodology or testing something uh, in two different countries at the same time, there's no issue with that. Um, it still needs to complete within a year and it still needs to be under the 15,000 budget, but that's fine. Um, what I would say, though, is in terms of presenting a proposal which is going to be sort of strong on sort of uh, clarity of what's happening and practicality, I would just look at how the coordination mechanisms for that will work. Uh, and uh, in terms of presentation with the application form, for those who've had a look at it, you'll see that there is the requirement to identify a lead local partner. So I would put there, uh, essentially choose the local partner that you feel is, is sort of strongest or is in the country where most work is happening. Um, but you will also need to ensure that you have a local partner 
in the second country in which you're working. So we would, we would struggle with an application which has, for example, only a local partner in Malawi, but then proposes work in Malawi and Zambia, because that would be rather undermining this principle of ensuring that there is a local partner to, to inform and, and to, to kind of provide for local ownership around activities that are happening overseas. So I hope that that is useful. Uh, another question, what projects uh, are the Scottish Government prioritising? Is it best to put in a capacity building grant before a feasibility one? So that's a very interesting question. I think that, that there is not, there is not any sort of predetermined process that, that organizations need to go through. Um, the grant program, I think, was originally conceived with the idea that organizations could sort of work up step by step, perhaps start with capacity building, then do use a feasibility study grant as a, as a needs assessment, then put in for a project grant, and then kind of build their way through. But that is not a requirement. Uh, and we have organizations that have done capacity building grants and then feasibility or have done feasibility and then capacity building. It really needs to, to sort of match, more important is to match the organization's need in terms of the, their capacities and what would be sort of clearly useful and appropriate at that point in their organizational development and how relevant the feasibility study would be in terms of informing follow-on work or informing um, the work of others in the sector. This is perhaps something to highlight that a feasibility study doesn't necessarily have to be anticipating follow-on work from the same organization, as long as there is a clear demonstration that it is of use and value to others in the sector who will be able to, to, to sort of, that it, that it will not sit on a shelf. You know, there is, I think, a, a very sensible reluctance to fund research that will, that will sit on a shelf. Uh, and uh, so demonstrating that there is an immediate practical application for the learning from feasibility study applications, that's, that's an important part of, of that proposal writing. Another question that we had recently was uh, regarding setting up a Scottish office. So an organization has asked, we are setting up a Scottish office now for our staff. Is OSCAR registration needed also to apply for a grant? So I was mentioning earlier that these being grants from the Scottish Government, there is a need for a Scottish presence. However, there is not a requirement for full OSCAR registration. Organisations that are applying need to be registered, um, but a charity which is registered in England and Wales and has established a clear Scottish presence um, uh, and would clearly have this grant managed by a project manager based in Scotland, that would still be eligible. There is no need for Oscar registration just for the sake of this project alone. Oh, and, and we, you know, it, it may well be that in setting up a Scottish office, it would be appropriate um, to, to also register in, in, in Scotland through OSCA, but that will be, I think, a, a, a decision for that particular organisation. It's, it's not something that we would require for the sake of these grants. Thank you, Chrissy. Uh, that was very helpful. We might just leave the opportunity open for people who still have questions they'd want to put into the chat box to do so. But in the meantime, uh, rather than waiting, I'm just going to move on and talk a bit about the extra support that the Alliance can provide. But we will be keeping an eye on that chat box for more questions. Uh, here at the Alliance and in its former incarnation as NIDOS, uh, we have a long tradition of providing support for applicants to the Scottish Government Small Grants Programme. Uh, but what we like to do is provide more technical assistance, if you like. It's more along the lines of how to develop a good, strong, fundable grant application, uh, rather than how can you be successful with your particular grant application, or how do we at the Alliance think that you are best able to uh, uh, phrase an application which has a good chance of success. So it is along those lines of technical assistance. 
and should be seen as in that light uh, and very much a, a light touch to it too. Uh, if you send us your application in draft, uh, but it has to be three weeks ahead of the deadline, and the deadline uh, is 8th of November, uh, then we will review it for you. Uh, but that's always subject to a qualification that uh, if we have a number of applications uh, to review and it's getting too close to the deadline, uh, don't hold us to that pledge. It's an expression of we would like to help rather than a firm commitment that we absolutely have to help. Uh, numbers do dictate the extent to which we can do that. But if you'd like us to review your application, really just to have a look at the strength of the application and to help spot any areas that we identify as weaknesses where you could put a bit more work in, then come to us as soon as you can and we'll pick up on that. What you can find online on the Alliance website, which might be useful to you, uh, are uh, uh, the proposal development workshops which we've been running recently and they were designed specifically for small charities and they cover subjects like project design, formulating your budgets, uh, monitoring evaluation and learning, due diligence. So that's all there on the Alliance website on the resources section of the Alliance website and those workshops were held very recently so uh, they should be up to date. Uh, Scotland Malawi partnership. Uh, it's a bit close to the AGM. Some of you might be attending it. I think it's this Saturday, isn't it? Uh, but uh, SNP are uh, also able to help you. What they can do, which we can't, is yeah. put at your service their uh, quite detailed and again over many years developed more context specific, country specific knowledge of Malawi. Uh, but again, it would be uh, with the same qualification. They, like us, don't want to get involved in, uh, uh, too closely in uh, helping you design your application. Again, it's back to that kind of technical assistance and how to strengthen the grant application. But don't forget Stuart Brown, uh, in particular, at Scotland Malawi Partnership. Uh, Stuart on the, is on the line and uh, we can unmute him in a minute. Uh, uh, before I do so, but this is the last bit that I'm going to hand over to Stuart, is to stress that that CORA website is very comprehensive and you can and are encouraged to email the CORA team with any questions that you have. It's international at cora.scot. Yes, Stuart. Hello, Jane. Hello, everybody. I hope you can hear me okay. Um, the, uh, there's a, a one page um, offer um, as to, to, to ways in which we can support, which I think Laura uh, has possibly shared um, with everybody. Um, but in summary, I suppose that we, we can help um, loosely in the, in the, the design and the approach and, and the concept of, of applications. We can help um, map and suggest uh, who else is, is doing what and provide introductions. We can broadly review um, applications. Um, again, if these come to us in, in good time, then we can hopefully provide something a bit more substantive than just being an additional pair of proofreading uh, eyes. And then we can try and, with enough notice, um, provide something a bit more um, bespoke in terms of, of convening um, direct conversations, Skype chats, and um, putting a piece in our weekly uh, um, online bulletin or on the website. Um, and also help um, broker um, Malawi connections. I suppose that our, our top five tips, very briefly, would be, um, as Chrissy has emphasised, to check that you fit um, all the criteria, really just to, to save wasting your time. Um, to, to start early, mindful of, of the deadline, um, especially to uh, have meaningful dialogue with partners in Malawi. We all know it can take time on, on both sides. To use the, the alliances, as James offered, uh, and us uh, as a sounding board, um, we really reckon that this is a, a model of a small grants um, program. Um, it's, it's intimate, really, with easy access to Scottish government, international development officials, to the grant managers in, in the form uh, of Chrissy and, and Lillian at, at CORA, and to us as support networks. And as we all know, it's a small community 
in Scotland, and we'd be really happy to signpost you to, to relevant um, potential um, supporters um, there. Um, so really, I, I suppose, to emphasize that if, if you think that the small grants program could work, could work for your organization, for capacity or, or feasibility, uh, feasibility grant, um, do apply. The success rate is, is really much higher than many other funding programs. Um, and as Jane um, said there, it is indeed our um, AGM on the 5th of October, a very brief advert for that. Great network networking opportunity at the Royal College of Physicians, 1.30 till 5 this coming um, Saturday, number 11 Queen Street. Um, Scottish Government and Minister for International Development, Ben McPherson, uh, will be there together with rising star of world music, um, Lazarus, who shares um, a producer with um, Baba Mal and um, Lana Del Rey and um, really exciting talent. But uh, do, do come along, there'll be lots of um, familiar faces and hopefully some new introductions there too. People with, with stalls um, selling all kinds of interesting um, Malawian goods and information. Thank you. Uh, I too would like to do, uh, take the opportunity for a quick commercial break. Uh, and I would like to draw attention to the work that my colleague Philippa Ramston has been doing on safeguarding. So uh, uh, if you go onto our website, you will find that the safeguarding package is all there. If you don't have your own safeguarding policies and procedures as well worked up as you think that they might be, or if you have policies and procedures and want to proof check them, uh, do have a look and see what's there. Uh, a lot of our resources on our website are available for members only, but safeguarding being such an important topic, uh, that is an area that both members and non-members can access. Uh, but again, if you have um, any questions about safeguarding, please come back to us and we can see what help we can give you. But if you are considering applying for uh, uh, the capacity building grant and are interested in, in using that opportunity to win some Scottish government funding to develop your policies, either here or in your partner countries, uh, then do please uh, bear that in mind. Uh, now, uh, we are going to have to finish up in the next few minutes, but I'd just quickly like to hand you back to Chrissy, who can do one quick overview for us of the application process. So great. Thank you so much, Jane and Stuart, uh, and for those who sent questions in. So as we had just a, a few minutes left at the end, uh, I thought that you might be interested in a very quick recap uh, of what, uh, what happens after you've sent in your application. So after applications have come in, then Lillian and I do an initial check on all the essential criteria. So to double check that there are not applications that, for example, haven't attached a budget or have some key essential document or have not met certain uh, key criteria. And then we will send all lead apl applicant organizations an email to confirm that you've got through that initial criteria check or, or uh, checking with you if, if there is something amiss there. And after that, depending on how many applications we have to review, there will be a number of weeks uh, or a couple of months uh, where we will go through a full assessment process on all of the applications that, that, that meet the, the essential criteria. Uh, and what that means within the CORA Foundation is that each application is assigned a particular assessor to do a first round, a very detailed read through, and then to hold an assessment call with each organization. Some organizations uh, prefer to do it with just the listed project manager. Other organizations prefer to have a wider call where they also include other staff and include partners in the field. We don't have a preference, but our only uh, sort of point there is that it needs to be just the one call because it can get quite difficult if we, if we hear different answers to the same question from, from different calls uh, and then need to sort that out. And that assessment call will be to discuss um, aspects of the application which didn't come through clearly to us uh, and it's also to discuss aspects of the application which we understood clearly but which we're really interested in points that we want to find out more about 
uh, and it will cover these areas that I was discussing earlier in the presentation. So about the organizations, about your plan, what you're going to do, and about how you're going to resource them. That key assessor who has that call with you will then write up a draft review and this will then be challenged by at least two or three other colleagues so that it's never one person who gets to decide on the final scoring for any application. So myself and Lillian will be involved and then usually at least two other colleagues from the wider CORA team who have experience of grant making and applications assessing. So the application is often read by around four people who will then all discuss and, and, uh, and decide uh, how it fits with everything else. Should it really be scored this on that criteria or not or what? And when we have all that sorted, then we prepare our recommendations report, which goes to Scottish Government. And when Scottish Government have decided which applications they wish to fund, then we will get back to you, usually with an initial phone call, um, uh, which may be embargoed if Scottish Government is trying to keep the announcements quiet for a particular press launch. But we will give you a call as soon as we possibly can because we do fully appreciate that people are waiting to hear and have other plans on hold. Uh, and then we will follow that up with, uh, with written confirmation. We also provide feedback on applications, so both those which are successful or unsuccessful, it, it doesn't matter. Um, we will send you an email with uh, at least two or three paragraphs of substantive feedback on the strengths and weaknesses of your application, because we feel that it's a really important learning opportunity for organisations to make sure that with the next application, whether it's to CORA and Scottish Government or whether it's to another donor, that uh, the, that application will be stronger uh, in different ways and that if there are mistakes that people don't repeat them. And that if there are things that you did really well in your application to us, then you make sure you do repeat those in the next one. Uh, and that's something that we send to everybody with the additional offer of uh, a follow-up phone call or uh, a meeting if people would like to, to have a more detailed feedback session with us. So I hope that gives you a sense of what happens after, in a way. Um, and uh, with that, just to, to, to reiterate that if you have any further questions on how to apply or the criteria, please, please do get in touch. We are always happy to take questions uh, and to speak or to respond to emails coming in from prospective applicants. Thank you everybody for joining us. Just a couple of uh, uh, quick pointers to finish up with. First of all, we're gonna email you, everyone who's taken part, uh, so you'll get a copy of the presentation. Uh, you'll also get an exit survey. We'd be enormously grateful if you'd fill this in for us and let us have it back. It's gonna pop up on your screen and it will be included with the, uh, uh, the email which will be circulated shortly. Uh, and one last thing from me, having uh, uh, again uh, thanked you, all our participants for taking part, for Stuart for taking time out at a particularly busy time at Scotland Malawi Partnership, and Chrissy for all her help and advice, is to encourage you warmly to submit your application. Uh, so if there's anything that is holding you back in terms of knowledge and advice, then don't let that hold you back. Come back either to Chrissy or to Stuart at the Scotland Malawi Partnership or to us. And uh, it will be, we will look forward very much to seeing what comes out at the far end of the process when those successful grants are announced. So don't leave it too late, particularly if you're working with a partner in country. And good luck. Thank you.